Uh, since I helped to develop that system, I know it works pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well nice to see you. Um, I'm excited to share with you several new ideas that I've been worked up. Uh, Give me a hug. I get rid of Sheila Cockers. Side note there. Um, the book that I wrote and is being published by Digital Legend came out last August, and I'm very pleased with the responses I've gotten on on uh, Amazon so far, five star reviews, and I feel like. The Lord gave me this book to write, and I'll show you the reasons why as we go through this presentation. Can you hear me in the back okay? <clears throat> the main messages of the book are that science without God is not true science. True science harmonizes with the true religion. Man's time, this I know, is an artifact of man's device. Um, Shared that last year, I'll not talk more about it this time. The most important is where we are in God's time, which will be the emphasis of this talk. And I'll show where we are with some data, which are very exciting. Um, love is the first law of heaven, we'll show this, that it's equivalent to obedience. It comes from the Torah and from the book of John. Uh, secularism, socialism, and materialism are satanic, societal encroachments and we give major countermeasures to these problems that inflict our society. Uh, I'll share some new scientific experiments validating the harmony between science and religion and uh, along with providing major countermeasures to satanic encroachment. Uh, I have five new insights that I'll share in fulfillment of actually prophecies of Joseph in Egypt. We don't talk much about Joseph in Egypt's prophecies, but they're very important to us, as I'll show you. Um, if we ask the question, what is the most important thing to know in this life or to do, I have the basic premise that it is based on John 17, 3. Jesus defines eternal life is to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, and God has sent. In the Doctrine and Covenants, it says that eternal life is the greatest of all the gifts of God. And God's work is to bring about the immortality and eternal life of man. If we go to the book of John, um, we find this very fundamental scripture. As the Savior says, I am the true vine, my father is a husbandman, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit purchases so that it can bring forth fruit like you do for a grapevine. Um, we're not all clean, but we can become through Christ abiding me. And as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in me, in the vine, which is Christ. No more can you except you abide in me. So, as he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. This is fundamental. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. So we're in the day, in my opinion, of the great harvest. Uh, the day of the great gathering to Zion, as I'll show you in the scriptures. And, experimental evidence. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And here is a beautiful scripture. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. I love the scripture and from Nephi, blessed are they who seek to bring forth my Zion at that day. They shall have the gift and power of the Holy Ghost to do so. As an example, in our, my life, I've been involved in missionary work most of my life in the church, and I love it. But 26 years ago, I was representing the United States in Paris at an international meeting about atomic clocks and timekeeping. 
I met Dr. Nikolai Kolsevyevsky, who was the principal timekeeper for Russia. <clears throat> um, at that time, the Cold War was on, security was tight in communist Russia, Moscow inter International Airport was a shambles. Cars were old and dilapidated, the roads were terrible, hotel accommodation was pathetic. However, their atomic clock facility was very impressive. He invited me to visit them and we had a great time there. Um, we gave him a copy of the Book of Mormon, learning that his father had actually been a, actually his grandfather, uh, a Russian Orthodox uh, priest. And the scripture in Alma 40 verse 8 was so philosophically deep that that, and of course the teachings of the missionaries, brought uh, Nick into the church. And that was a very exciting thing for us. Um, Establish that friendship and see him join. Uh, a few years later, we were privileged to take him through the Hawaiian temple. He was the first Russian to take out his endowments in the Hawaiian temple, and that made it into the ensign. It was a nice article in the January '97 ensign about the uh, mix. Uh, the Russians invited me last year. Uh, Nick was right in the middle of that invitation, I'm sure, to come to. Uh, Moscow and to an uh, international meeting on the metrology of time and space. It was held in Suzdal. This is a unique city about 100 miles north of Moscow. Uh, it was not affected by the Russian Revolution. There are some 300 beautiful Russian Orthodox cathedrals in this town. It was a great experience to be there. Uh, this is a symposium attendees. To my great surprise, uh, they gave me a 50-year award for my work over the last 50 years in time and frequency, signed by more than 40 of their top scientists. And I was asked to give a plenary talk at this conference. It was a totally great experience. While there, I attended the ward with Nick uh, there in Moscow, learned some very interesting things. Um, so I'd like to do a little bit of a comparison uh, for me, it was a real eye-opener. Over the 25 and a half years of quarter centuries, uh, the massive and relevant changes. The airport now is five terminals. It's one of the finest in the world. Uh, the young people are vibrant, bright intelligence. Uh, I saw no obesity among them. Uh, they have cars bought from all over the world. Uh, they have a big traffic problem because the infrastructure for roads is not adequate for all their cars. A lot of new construction, both commercial and residential. Young people speak good English. When I was on the airplane, I was impressed with how many young people were going back and forth from Moscow uh, to the United States. Uh, they sell massive amounts of oil and gas, giving them sustained cash flow. In their economy, morality, they're on the rise, while America is, is in the decline. These are some of the presenters at the conference to give you an example. The gentleman on the right is their official cesium beam atomic clock expert, and he was anxious to show me how theirs is going to be better than anybody else's in the world. We have a problem here. Sterling, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, summarizing in two columns the changes that have occurred. Uh, 
I see Russia as part of scattered Israel, and the Lord has raised them up. I saw in their countenances, uh, they covered 12 time zones. I learned that all 12 tribes of the House of Israel have been identified in their picture of the blessings. Their military strength is awesome. The economy is growing. Voted against gay marriages. Uh, strong cultural Christian growing. They have gone in the last 19 years from 31% uh, Christianity to 72%. Very interesting. One of the fastest growing Christian nations. Um, I see the Lord that will use them, like the Lamanites for the Nephites, to purchase in our wickedness if we don't repent. There's always a repentance clause, thank goodness. And I hope the book will help. I took 12, uh, 20 copies with me last September, and they were gone the first day of the conference. Uh, in my research, looking at Christianity in Russia, I found that Putin was secretly baptized when he was a year and a half old. His mother gave him a cross, which he wears against his chest continually. He's kind of a two-mode man. He certainly has strong Christian feelings, but we see other things as well. Um, I see them, the converts will be a strong people, uh, a Zion-oriented people, and we'll talk more about that. In regard to Joseph in Egypt, he was born 3,760 years ago uh, in Haran, uh, crossroads of the east, sold into slavery, uh, interprets Pharaoh's dream, becomes chief over the land, uh, and he's saved his people temporally at that time. The prophecies in Ether 13 that Moroni shares with us uh, say that the descendants of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh will save the house of Israel temporally and spiritually, and we'll see some direct evidence of that as we go through this presentation. Um, he prophesied concerning all his seed, and the scriptures tell us that there are not many greater than the prophecies of Joseph. We have excerpts of those, I'll share a few. He prophesied some 3,700 years ago, and here's some examples. In 2 Nephi 3.11, a seer, who is Joseph Smith, will I raise up out of the fruit of thy loins. Joseph Smith is a descendant of Joseph in Egypt. And unto him will I give power to bring forth my word, modern scriptures, Book of Mormon, etc., unto the seed of thy loins to all Americans, because America is the land of Joseph, as we see in Genesis 49. And not to the bringing forth my word only, saith the Lord, but to the convincing them of my word, the Bible, which has already gone forth among them. In other words, this prophecy is telling us about a day when the Bible will be doubted by a lot of people. 93% of the major scientists in the survey in 1993 were atheists in America. The problem that has been outlined in the previous two talks shows very seriously we have a problem with the decay of Christianity and of belief in the Bible in our country. And one of the prophecies of Joseph is that the modern scriptures, and I'll show you direct evidence of this, beautiful evidence, will validate the Bible to show that it is of God. Um, so in other words, we have evidence coming in fulfillment of prophecy. Um, the five examples that I'll share in this hour are the existence of the Adamic language and the harmony between the standard works and the Bible, uh, where we are in God's time, which is very exciting, the land bountiful, the plan of salvation as shown in the Hartland model very beautifully, three forms of evolution that are very significant as a major encroachment on our society, and there are many false doctrines. Section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants says specifically there are two ways Satan has of deceiving us. One is disobedience and the other one is traditions, implying false traditions. In the book, the whole section two of the book is dealing with the many false traditions that have crept into our society and showing the solution thereto. 
Um, in example one, we have the weak things, if you will, confounding the wise. And David only needed one stone, and we have in this one stone two simple phrases that you'll find very impressive in terms of confounding the people who do not believe in the Bible. Um, the phrase, and it came to pass, occurs some 1400 times in our standard works. Uh, the phrase, and it shall come to pass, some 150 times. You'll see the significance of these phrases are very profound and actually show the existence of the Adamic language. A fun commentary, when Mark Twain visited Utah in the 60s, 1860s, countering Brigham Young, he wrote that the Book of Mormon was chloroform in print. Uh, he also said if you removed all the phrases and it came to pass, you'd have a pamphlet. <laughs> um, Joseph in Egypt prophesied, we'll see, the phrase and it came to pass validates the Bible and shows the harmony of the scriptures. I learned about the significance of this phrase from uh, Professor Felix Meinhardt of Pretoria University. He's a great linguist who a member of the uh, uh, Dutch Reformed Church. He was asked to translate the Book of Mormon back in 1972. They needed to translate it from English to Afrikaans. Uh, he was the only person on the planet at that time who knew English, Afrikaans, Hebrew, and Egyptian. Um, no one else could do what he did at that time. Um, Professor Meinhardt first declined, and that night in his prayers, the Spirit convicted him and said, uh, you've been asking for some special task to use your linguistic skills, and I gave you the Book of Mormon, and you declined. He knew as a teenager, uh, Hebrew, Greek, uh, Egyptian, learned all the European languages, uh, an amazing linguist. So he called the mission president uh, the next morning and said, I'll do it, after a sleepless night. Um, as was his style, he went to the center of the book because a, an author changes in their writing style and they tend to stabilize toward the, in the middle of a book. So he thought, I'll go to the middle of the Book of Mormon and figure out uh, the style and then translate it. And he immediately recognized that it was not authored in English. Um, he deduced after some months that it was written in ancient Egyptian with Hebrew nouns added. And then he read 1 Nephi 1, 1 and 2. I, Nephi, write this in Egyptian. <laughs> he said, I could have saved myself months. <laughs> that I started in the beginning. Um, he shared his experience in the state conference in 1993. John Pontius was there as a missionary, and I have his journal entry in regard to that. Um, very fascinating. Uh, he bore testimony. He says, I don't know what Joseph Smith was before or after he translated the Book of Mormon, but he was a prophet of God. Only a prophet could have done what he did at that time. Um, I shared this experience at a talk I gave at Snow College uh, a year ago, March, and talked to the, we had dinner afterwards with the professors at the university, or at the college, and one of them came up to when I shared this story and said, I was there as a missionary also. This is uh, Brian Nimble, who's a professor in the engineering department. And I asked him if he could work up his journal and share with me his experience. And uh, I have John's story uh, written up in, in the book, as well as Brian Newbold's story. And uh, just some highlights from it. He, during his mission, met Brother Swinepool, who worked with Professor Meinhardt in this translation process, along with Bishop Brun. And he said, that the translations were spot on. Um, he felt called and prepared for the work, uh, the most spiritual experience of his life. He actually took the book, translation of it, to Pretoria University and said, we should accept this as scripture. 
He also took it to his church and said the same. And they, of course, said, no, thank you. Um, if we look at that phrase, and I felt um, back a few years ago, our bishop asked us to read the Book of Mormon in 100 days, did so, and that phrase jumped out to me along with several others that seemed non-traditional English-American phrases. And so I felt to go to the scriptures and study that phrase. Uh, I found that in Genesis, there are 61% of the chapters use that phrase. Uh, as you go through the Old Testament, it declines to 22%, and the New Testament, only 13%, and only Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospel writers, use that phrase. And they were the writers pulling from the ancient the Old Testament records to prove to the Greeks, the Romans, and the Hebrews that Jesus was the Messiah. So they're very significant. Whereas um, Peter, James, John, John, Paul, Jude, and Joseph Smith use the phrase zero. Now, of course, Joseph has an extensive in the Book of Mormon, but those are, those are not his revelations. Those came by translation. Um, you notice a decreasing trend in usage over time. Uh, if we plot that, we see the following plot as it increases up to the book of Genesis. It turns out that if we look at the Western Hemisphere, we see the same decline. So the data I showed you is for the Eastern Hemisphere. In the Western Hemisphere, in the Book of Mormon, we find it decreasing in time as well. Uh, Mormon uses it, other prophets, Nephi, and so forth, but Moroni uses it zero, the son of Mormon. Um, so even though Joseph uses it zero percent, it shows up in the, in the Book of Mormon, the Book of Moses, Abraham, extensively. Fifty-seven occurrences there. The Doctrine and Covenants usage is zero except for three quotes from the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Uh, by the way, if you want this PowerPoint presentation, I'll email it to you if you want, want to know. Uh, so we see a decreasing trend usage over time in both the Western and the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, a good example also of the significance of this phrase, it's used as a historic marker. For example, in Luke 2, uh, we read the, the very important historic event that came to pass that Caesar Augustus sent forth a decree that all the world should be taxed, and we have in that chapter the birth of Christ. So we see it not only as time to past events, but as an important historic marker. So we have a hypothesis here, based on the data, that it seems to be a declining phrase over time, devolving with languages as they evolve to our history. Could it have been a phrase in the Adamic language? Could it have been an important historic marker that Adam had in his language and that we don't have so significantly today? So I asked the question, how can I test this hypothesis? Well, we're very fortunate to have the Jaredite record in the Book of Ether. What happened to the Tower of Babel? Their language was not confounded. So we have, in their language, the closest of all of our scriptures to the Adamic. And so I went to the book of, of um, Ether and looked at the occurrence and 100% of the chapters is, is more extensively there than anywhere else in scripture. So, um, Zenos' allegory is, is it significantly an ancient prophet? Um, so the opposition to evolution, we see actually a devolution of language. And if we plot the data, we have a direct indication of it being tied to the Adamic language. Uh, it's interesting that the translator of the Book of Ether, or the one who brought it to us, was Moroni. And Moroni used it zero in his revelations. But yet in that record, as he translated it, you have 100%. Um, so from scientific uh, induction, I learned from Paul Ramesh, who was one of the contributors to this conference, Ramesh, um, that we learn truth in two ways, basically. Scientific induction and scientific deduction. 
what we have done so far is using scientific induction, we have validated a hypothesis. Um, <laughs> and I learned a, a very interesting book from a good friend, Lee Nielsen, of the secret doctrine of the Kabbalah, recovering the key of Hebraic science uh, by the late professor Leonora Lee. She talks about these phrases and basically shares that the phrase, and it came to pass, is a phrase tying to ancient Hebrew and tying to significant historic events. And it has the numeric gematria equivalent to the word El, which means God. So every time you see that phrase, God is telling you something very important. So it gives you a whole new perspective about what we have here. So I looked at the phrase, and it shall come to pass, when I learned from Dr. Leonora Lee that that phrase ties to Jehovah. So anyway, when I read from her book on this ancient Kabbalah Hebrew science that the phrase, and it shall come to pass, ties about future events and ties to the name of Jehovah. That made me very excited. And so I immediately went to our scriptures and I found some 150 occurrences of that phrase. And lo and behold, using scientific deduction, her, her hypothesis, our scriptural database from modern LDS scriptures validates her ancient hypothesis perfectly. So we have two direct validations of the Adamic language and of Eastern and Western Hemisphere decay of the phrase, and it came to pass, and the phrase, and it shall come to pass, tie into, guess what? Our day. If you look at the occurrences of that phrase, a totally different set of prophets are talking. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, all of the prophets that talked about our day are using that phrase. Joseph Smith, Jesus Christ, use it extensively in prophesying of our day. If you go to Third Nephi, I don't need a computer. <laughs> um, if you go to Third Nephi, you find something very exciting. Christ comes in Third Nephi chapter 11. He's ministering to the Nephites in chapters 11 through 19. There are zero occurrences of the phrase, and it shall come to pass. In chapter 20, he starts to talk to you and I. Guess what? He uses the phrase, and it shall come to pass, talking about our day, talking about Isaiah, talking about the events to come. So in these 150 occurrences that we have filtered throughout the scriptures, you have a book of scriptures that could be pulled together to tell you a great deal about what's happening today. And that hasn't been exploited yet. They're there as gold. I, uh, if you look at the book, Appendix M, as a mother of the book, talks in great detail about and it shall come to pass. Appendix B talks extensively about and it came to pass. And the contents of the book itself, uh, chapter 23, where we are in God's time, and uh, chapter 3 also about what is God's word, talks extensively about the Professor Meinhardt story and documents what I have shared with you uh, extensively. Okay, um, please. So where are we in God's time? You're getting ahead of the story. Where are we in God's time? It's, maybe we'll get part If we don't, I'll, I'll wing it. But, uh, um, okay, so we have a very interesting thing here. Realize that Joseph in Egypt made a prophecy that the scriptures coming forth from Joseph Smith would validate the Bible. And that's exactly what these simple phrases do. I mean, the probability of those phrases occurring as they do throughout the scriptures, validating this hypothesis that I've shared from you with you, both by induction and deduction scientifically, give a solid proof of the validity of the Bible. 
Isn't that great? So it's really exciting. The Bible is true. Now you can know it scientifically. <laughs> and a scientist can read you know, my book. And if he's honest in heart, he'll know it too. So I, I was so excited when I went to Russia last September and, and took 20 copies and they were gobbled up. I, I learned from my publisher that a lot of copies are now going to Europe. So apparently a lot of my colleagues and friends over there are interested in what we've got to say. While we're talking, let me uh, show you this case of quartz. And you can come up and look at it after lunchtime. It has water in it. Geologists have a tough time with this. Explaining how, because quartz it can be made in an autoclave. So to make it with water in it doesn't happen very readily in an autoclave. But if you look at the flood model, with 3,000 meters of water where these crystals were formed, it gives you exactly the conditions, mineral pressure and temperature to form this. You are looking at a quartz crystal that was made in flood. And these are readily available around the globe. So this is some 3,500 years old, whatever, and was made in flood. And geologists can't. They, they scratch their head when they look at this. They give you an explanation, but it's about two paragraphs long. It doesn't make any sense. Then <laughs> the second example that I'll share with you, um, we have in Dr. Covenants 29, the very important scripture. It says that, but remember as my words have gone forth out of my mouth, even so shall they fulfill. The first shall be last, the last shall be first in all things whatsoever I have created by the word of my power, which is the power of my spirit. So, notice, um, that he uses in all things, that's pretty powerful. And we'll show you some direct examples of that. The Savior first introduces this phrase in Matthew 19. In the plan of salvation, we have, um, Anyway, we have in all things the Lord, by His Spirit, does His work. Here's a, a, a very good example in the plan of salvation. We have pre-mortal, celestial, chiastic, garden of Eden, millennium, atonement in our celestial sphere. Um, we have first, last, last, first. Israel was the first to receive the gospel. We have the Old Testament account telling that. They rejected the Christ, went to the Gentiles, the New Testament, of the great apostasy, rejecting the gospel, so the Gentiles, the last, become the first with the restoration. And then we have a scripture in uh, 30 Nephi 16, 10, where the Savior says, when the Gentiles reject the fullness, it will, I will bring the gospel back to Israel. So then the first becomes the last, and I'll show you that's where we are. We have these blood moons that we've seen several times in this conference. This is from Val Brinkerhaus book. Um, and so we just had last uh, April 4th. That's a picture of the one that occurred a week ago today. Um, Prophet Zenos described first last in uh, Jacob 5 as he describes the gathering of the house of Israel. Verse 60, and the branches of the natural tree, the lost tribes will I graft in to the natural branches, which is the gathering from the four corners of the earth of the remnant bring them together and they shall bring forth the natural fruit and they shall be, notice the phrase, one. So it'll be this grand harmony. That means the Zion society that we're looking forward to. And I believe these blood moons are exactly this transition time as I'll show you from some other data. Um, in Ether chapter 13, fundamental, Moroni gives us from the prophet Ether, Again, first, last, last, first, as he talks about the New Jerusalem, the Old Jerusalem, I suggest you study those 12 verses carefully. They're beautiful and profound. Um, 
on the 20th of March I wrote this in my journal, which was the equinox, um, early equinox. Uh, we had on that day three important events. We had a super moon, had a full solar eclipse, and we had the vernal equinox. I had looked through astronomical journals and all over the place. I cannot find another occurrence of that triple where it has occurred before. And it's exactly between the two blood moons before in 2014 and the two blood moons after. So it's chiastic in that sense as well. Um, and I think the Lord is giving the signs in the heavens are there for us if we'll look at them to give us very important information. A uh, little background here, in 1990 we were in Boulder, Colorado. They had a religious comparison debate at the university for the students. I was asked to represent our church. Um, I used the 13 Articles of Faith and made a handout. We only had seven minutes to share what we believed. And I used that and Dr. Uh, Count Leo Tolstoy's prophecy uh, of which was in 1892. He was talking to uh, Andrew, um, Professor at Cornell University. Um, and he told him, he says, the Mormon religion will become the greatest force on the face of the earth in the third and fourth generation if they continue faithful. So I felt to plot the data uh, of the growth of the church on four parameters, membership, number of languages of the Book of Mormon, the number of missionaries, and the number of copies of the Book of Mormon going out per year. And you can see that all of these kind of exponentially increase. Well, um, in 2010, I was serving as ward mission leader in Fountain Green, and our bishop asked, us, asked me to update this so we could use it for missionary work. And I said, sure. So I went to the church and got the data. And lo and behold, the slope on all four of those parameters turned down after the year 2000. So you ask the question, why? And again, it's this problem of encroachment, of secular encroachment on the membership of the church. This is a very, very serious problem. And I feel this is one of the fundamental reasons why the Lord had me write the book, is to counter that encroachment. Um, some interesting data. The Lord will gather Israel from the four corners of the earth. We served a mission in uh, Ivory Coast, 97-99. I was brought to tears when President Monson announced the temple in Augustine. Because when they were there, it was one state. Now there are eight states. The growth there has been 800% you know, in 16 years. It's astounding. If you look in the United States over that same period, 4.5%. And if you look over the last half decade, only 1%. So you're seeing this secular encroachment on the membership in the United States. The demoralization that has been caused by that is very soon. Um, so we're at this juncture. But the Lord has promised in this time, section 121, that all things will be revealed. It's a, the it's a most exciting time in the history of the planet. Um, I'm not going to run out of time because of this little technical stuff. I'm not going to have time to go through this list. It's lunch time. <laughs> um, okay. I have uh, on the website, our Sterling put this up just last night, a very interesting article. Where did the Book of Mormon take place? Is it important? It turns out that it's very important, as it says in Ether, because this is the promised land, and if we don't repent, we'll be swept off, is what the prophecy says. Um, this is uh, near Newark, Ohio, uh, four and a half square mile earthworks. Very, very interesting. If you look at uh, the object on the left, 
That is a circle that has a trench on the inside, 30 acres in size, and that trench on the inside filled with water denotes a womb, a place of birth. So this denotes the pre-mortal in the plan of salvation, a place where we're born spirit children of our heavenly parents. Then you have a birth canal. You'll notice this birth canal is bigger than that one, which comes into the earth, the four corners of the earth. This is 20 acres, that's 30 acres. In other words, one third part of Father's children didn't make it to the earth. So it denotes the fall of the, of the angels who didn't make it. Then you have the direct path onward and then spirit prison. You go up to the top phrase there, you have that great octagon denoting the millennium, and it's 50 acres. In other words, 20 plus 30 is 50 which means that Father has a perfect plan for all of his children. I think that's really exciting. And then the last circle up at the top of the screen is the same acreage as the earth down below. It's a circle rather, rather than a square. So you go to perfection in the celestial kingdom. So that denotes the celestial kingdom. So in this four and a half square mile earthworks, you have the plan of salvation mapped out. It's in Newark, Ohio. Um, the, the angle of um, the angle of the great pyramid or the, of the uh, octagon and the circle are exactly the same angle as the Giza pyramid. Um, so that angle of the Giza pyramid is exactly the same, 51.8 degrees, which is the angle of what we call a divine ratio. And you'll see that embedded all over in those earthworks, that they understood the geometry. Um, okay. This is a very important one. Example four, we have three kinds of evolution that Satan is using to encroach upon the morality of our society. Organic evolution, Darwin. Social evolution was created by Morgan and Powell, who were influenced by Darwin. Political evolution was uh, instigated by Engels and Marx, who were intrigued by Morgan's work. So you see the chain. Interestingly, when was Darwin born? Same time as Joseph Smith. Within the same decade, they were they were born. So this is Satan using the influence of uh, organic evolution to tear down the gospel. Uh, Darwin's evolution uh, was proven wrong at the time by Louis Agassiz. Again, wrong by Stephen Meyer in the great book Signature in the Cell and Darwin's Doubt. Uh, the Garden of Eden was seen by a dear friend of ours, Ralph Jensen, in his near-death experience. There are three fundamental problems with evolution. Number one, if you have no Adam and no fall, there is no need for a Christ. So organic evolution is, in its very basis, antichrist. That's a very important point. Um, you saw the sports, the time of the flood. Um, very interesting story about the Clovis point, discovered in 1929. It is the most sophisticated point uh, ever found. It has a very complex concave aspect on the back end of it, hooked onto the shaft. We have a very difficult time replicating it today. Uh, they have found many more of those after this one was found and have developed what they call a Clovis culture. Very interesting, as you study this culture, you find, number one, there are no occurrences of the Clovis point in Asia, East Asia, contrary to the evolutionary theory, uh, because it's the oldest point. You also find that the society ended cataclysmically by the flood. 
So, it, and if you look at the origin of where the most dense area of the coldest points after many more were discovered, guess what? Adam on diameter. So the family of Adam used the coldest point in their hunting. A very similar story as Rod has shared can be made with DNA showing mitochondrial aid going back to 6,000 years ago. Uh, recent, not too long ago, dinosaur bones and human beings were found in Colorado. Um, so, the last example, and we've only got 10 minutes to cover it. Um, there are three sections in the book. The center one, as I mentioned, is totally dealing with false traditions. Um, and we'll go through some of those. Um, fundamental message in the Doctrine and Covenants, are you Gentiles, and in Ether chapter 8, the need for us to repent. Um, we're told very clearly by Moroni, awake to your awful situation. When you see these things come among you, and that's where we are. Uh, New Lies for Old Amstel Glitzen, he told of what's coming, uh, very interesting books. Uh, Jesus talked in a prophecy about abominations that would come, there are several we could list. Uh, Newton is the greatest scientist that has ever lived. He says, we account the scriptures of God to be the most sublime philosophy. I find more sure marks of authenticity in the Bible than any profane history, whatever. No sciences are better attested than the religion of the Bible. I thank Steve Jones, who's here, for this quote. He went over to Cambridge and pulled this from Newton's personal files. Uh, if science aligns with the Bible, then here it is true. Uh, in writing the book, I have some 207 experts that I draw from. I'm very fortunate to make good friends with Professor Chauncey Riddle, who is a retired professor of philosophy at BYU. He's written a book, Thinking Independently, which for me is a classic. And in it, he proves and basically shows that history and science has a set of premise that excludes God. And hence, that's why we are where we are. You don't have to do that. You can include God if you wish. In chapter one of my book, develops a new method of using scientific analysis, which includes God. Um, there's some problems and questions and issues there that I try to do very soundly, and I've had good science friends read it, and they seem to be happy with what I have here. Um, I've been invited back to Russia um, this next month to a navigation conference, and I'll take a lot more books with me. Um, and when I was first given the invitation, Sterling had received the message, and I didn't want to go. Um, it's a lot of work, and uh, I'm retired. <laughs> My wife laughs at that. Um, but anyway, I put it on the altar and the Lord said, you need to go. And so I then asked the question, what can I do to teach the gospel? Because I would, did not want to go over there and do science. I wanted to go over there and share the gospel. And so I prayed for nearly a month about what I could do. And one morning I woke up at 3.25 and for three and a half hours, the Lord downloaded what I was to do. It's only two pages in the science paper, but it's dynamite. And I'll not have enough time to go through it. Um, it ends up with an equation which mathematically proves that John 17 is valid, how we can become one, even though there are seven billion different worldviews for seven billion different people. It teaches in those two pages how we can become one, what Christ asks us to, with the Father and the Son. And it's based on, on, on mathematics and uh, Bible statements, Bible scriptures, and so I thank the Lord for it, and it'll be interesting to see what impact it has on my Russian colleagues and international folks who come, because people are coming from all over the world uh, to that conference. So. 
it will be an exciting time. Um, I felt impressed uh, a few years ago to study some the unified field theory that Einstein did not finish before he died. We found, we filled some of the Lord's physics in what we call a dialog film line structure. This is described on our website, Alan's time, in great detail. Uh, but it ties into the spirit in a very fundamental way because we learned that there's spirit matter, that these dialog lines connect us, and we've shown physically in the laboratory their existence. So we've proven their existence, we've proven they have quantum states, and also from the spirit we learn that these dialog lines connect us to our heavenly parents at the time of our spirit birth. So they're very important, uh, they tie basically everything to everything. They're cylindrical in nature, uh, the atomic structure of an atom is basically spherical, and these are cylindrical. They're made of spirit matter, they carry all of the force fields, and there's we feel like we're infants in the words learning about this, but it's very exciting. Um, there are seven spectral regions uh, in these uh, dialogue field structures, just like seven is the magic and the words of arithmetic. Um, so we have this, what I call new old theory, to explain many important things about the gospel as well as about science. Um, Einstein, in his theory, and by the way, when GPS was being developed, we contracted with uh, Professor Neil Ashby, the University of Colorado, to do the relativity for GPS. He's become a very good friend over the years. I used to take classes from him. And Einstein gives us four dimensions. And GPS would not work without Einstein's relativity. And in one of the appendices of the book, uh, there's an article called The Science of Time Kingdom, which explains that in detail, if you're interested. But, um, this next topic is very important. Jeremy Clark said, We Christians professing the name of Christ, proclaiming his gospel, give the lie to our professions and our proclamations. We become a sounding brass, tinkling silver. If we do not live the brotherhood of man, if we do not ourselves obey this, divine law of love. Um, Dennis Rasmussen spent some time with the rabbis in New York and he learned that the Torah from these rabbis is also a law of love. So I asked myself the question, what is the first law of heaven? We often say it's obedience. And so in John chapter uh, 14, we have a very important scripture. If you love me, you keep my commandments. So love implies obedience. In 21, we read that obedience implies love. I learned from my good friend Chauncey Riddle 60 years ago in a philosophy of religion class that if I have these two logical relationships, then love is equivalent to obedience. So given that, proof, if you will, from John 14 that raises the definition of obedience to a much higher level. Namely, that obedience is because we love. We do it because we want to, and we want to please the Heavenly Father rather than we have to. Uh, I have this little catchphrase here. We often look at the commandments as I've got to do it. We can change it to I get to do it. Um, DNC 59 teaches us that the commandments are opportunities for exaltation. In the temple the other day, I was there with our daughter Michaela, and I learned that obedience definition is motivation toward joy. If you listen to the temple ceremony carefully, that's what it's about. The Lord wants us to be, man is, that he might have joy. Um, Mormon gives us the key in this great scripture, 748. This is actually Mormon speaking, quoted by my own eye. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart, that ye may be filled with this love. Then John says so beautifully, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected. Um, 
the book, as I mentioned, is available from Digital Legend. They've got a special price, conference expo price. Um, this triad of books is available. All, all four of these, I think you'll find very interesting books. You can buy any three for their special price of 55. And then we made a special for this talk arrangement with Chauncey Riddle and our publisher and myself to make these two books available uh, for $25. Uh, so basically my message to you is let's live to God and live. If you know someone who has left the church and caught up with a secular encroachment and you think they'll read the book, I'll give you a call. Thank you very much.